Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our latest People as Leader series. Uh, with me today I have Neil Carberry who's CEO of REC, Recruitment and Employment Confederation. Welcome Neil. Thank you. Joining Great pleasure us. to be here. Now, you've done the GC Index. Mm. We have your profile. Uh, you come out as a strong playmaker, so we will be talking about that. But let's weave that into your career so far. You've had a successful career. Uh, how's that reflected, do you think, in your GC Index profile? Well, actually, I would recognise the uh, the profile uh, pretty uh, clearly in in what I've done today. I've always been involved in complex situations that have required a deal of uh, negotiation to 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 get through in my early career. Uh, you know, I've done things like trade union negotiation and so forth. And now, as we come into an organisation like the REC, well, the REC is a substantial membership organisation that. Uh, you know, I've been basically tasked with modernising and uh, for, uh, from a leader's perspective that requires carrying people with me but also getting more delivery from the team that we have here um, and I'm a great believer that as a leader and especially in the labour market, the jobs market we have today, it can't just be about you kind of ordering things off the menu, it has to be about engaging people and, and, and opening up people to drive their own progress. Now does this does this, so this is a leadership style that's worked for you. Does it fit with your view of the world, your values about the world? Yes, and I think it's really important to be authentic as a leader. Um, that doesn't mean that sometimes you don't have to play things slightly differently according to the situation. Of course, you're always reading the, uh, the situation, what the appropriate way to uh, step in or indeed lean back from different situations is. But for me, I've always felt that the best work is done by teams that are, yes, skilled, but also motivated and engaged with their work. And they get that from that concept, you know, it, it, that concept of control. They have a sense that they are in control of delivering something really good. And I think as a playmaker, I see my role as helping people deliver things that are really good. Yes. Uh, and uh, your description just does conjure up that image that down the years you would have developed a number of skills to support your playmaker proclivity, as we call it. What thoughts on that? Give us some idea of the, the, the key skills that playmakers need to make that style work for them. Well, I think the most important thing is, that understand, is understanding the balance of delegation. Uh, because as a playmaker you're not leaning back from what the team is doing but neither are you leaning in and micromanaging it so you need very clearly with the team to have articulated what your role in the process is going to be and what the touch points are but I think you also have to have clarity in your own mind about when you might break those rules uh, you know there are situations where you will need to be that kind of alpha leader uh, we had an example recently here where we had some technical problems that meant we weren't servicing members as well as we should for, for, for a couple of hours. At that point, I think it's absolutely the leader's role to step in and say, look, here's the, the plan that we're going to deliver to get us back on track. When, uh, when, when there's a significant issue, very pressing that you need to deal with. Sounds as if you see yourself as the guardian of the greater good. Oh, I'm a great believer in purpose as a, as a leadership uh, tool and I, I don't think I would have taken this job if I didn't believe that the purpose of the REC is the greater good. I think recruiters, uh, and we speak for 14,000 in different forums here, um, recruiters open up opportunity for people in their careers and they help our economy to grow. And if they do that well, yes, the recruitment sector in the UK is a great success, and we should be—that's what we're about supporting. But we support it because it is for the greater good. Yes, and listen, I don't want to lose something you said just a moment ago, which I think is uh, our, our um, viewers will find interesting, uh, and and that's to do with as a playmaker, being comfortable in that consensus building space, but knowing when to be more directive. Is that what you're describing? Yes, I think you have to clearly work from 
a sense of where direction, vision, where we're going, and and try to get that widely shared in the organisation. Yeah. And where the organisation or maybe individuals or teams start to drift away from that, you have to be pretty bold got about it. course correction. Got it, got it. That that is you being the guardian, isn't it? Of what's been agreed, greater good purpose, however, however, however we might define that. Yeah, and, and sometimes the interactions that you'll have to have to, to do that course correction might not be the most comfortable if you come from a playmaker yes. point of view, but that's ultimately uh, the critical skill set, is knowing which interaction at which yes. time will land in the way you need it to. Although it also reinforces the need to get that sense of alignment to purpose very clear yes. right, at, right at the outset. Yes, absolutely. In an organisation like the REC, that's about putting the members at the heart of everything. Um, I think for us, member-centric doesn't mean just waiting for the members to tell us what to do. It's about actively making choices about what's best for the members and being really clear about not making decisions because they're easier for the REC. Yes. Um, Given your playmaker profile, give us an idea of the roles that have felt most, uh, the best fit with, with that style of leadership. Where have you felt most at home? Well, I, first and foremost, I'll please the REC Council by saying here. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think the, the fact that I have 25 yes. recruitment leaders on my council makes a playmaker uh, profile quite helpful for building consensus there. But indeed. also the breadth of the work of the REC is such that we are, you know, we are a complex organisation for an organisation with only 70 staff. So how that interacts in boosting... Uh, interaction across the teams. I'm really proud today um, of the work we've been doing on our uh, campaigns where we're engaging the whole organisation. I feel the RSC is becoming less siloed. I think that speaks to uh, some of uh, what I'm trying to bring to Indeed. the role. Yeah. Likewise, you know, one of the external roles I've had for a number of years now is I sit on the Low Pay Commission. Um, and that feels to me innately comfortable because there you're dealing with as nine individuals coming from very different backgrounds with a question which has an answer because it is in pounds and pence every year yes uh, where you have to both be very clear about where you are and what you think but also it's a process of negotiation and discussion and consensus building yeah. and that sits really comfortably Lovely. with me that, 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 those good examples and, and the other the next obvious question where have you felt least at home if you can talk about that so I did, ha I did have one role for about a year in my time at the CBI, and very early on in my time at the CBI, where I was working for a sector group, um, and the work programme was very rigid. Uh, it, you know, we had a view to take forward. I had limited ability personally to, to, to influence that, and actually the, um, there wasn't a great deal of conflict or a big, challenging question to be solved. And that, that felt to me quite disengaging. Yes, yes, I can, I can imagine that. This may take us on to uh, my f final question, um, which is to do with one of the skills of a playmaker very often is recognising the talents of others around them and being able to bring the best out of people. Uh, who are those folk who compliment you, compliment with an E, those yes. folk who you think, I must have that individual on my team, what, 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 what do they look like? So um, the flippant answer and then the serious answer. <laughs> right. The flippant answer is, I'm a great believer in that saying of hire people you think are better than you. Yeah. Um, I'm it, not sure that's the flippant, but... Uh, but but my, my, my sense is I always want to bring people in who challenge me, yes. uh, because I think if they challenge me, they're asking the right sorts of questions. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of kind of slightly going to depth for, for that, I think I'm uh, very strong when it comes to setting purpose and thinking about the shape of the organisation as, uh, as it's moving forward. And at the other end of that then, you know, the week after next I'm seeing five of our largest members, chief executives. I've got to uh, be able to sell the finished pro uh, product. What I need from a lot of my team is an ability to pick up stuff and drive it through implementation. That comes out very clearly in my profile. It, it does, that's your uh, weakest uh, proclivity. And, and, we, and we absolutely have to own, own that. I'm, I'm not here to be the operational guy, I'm here to, to set the framework within which the operational guys deliver. 
Um, so I'm looking for people, say, I'm interviewing externally for new staff. I'm looking for people who uh, buy the vision, buy the purpose, uh, but most importantly, aren't willing to try things and to push, push them to uh, to uh, delivery. I I got very frustrated years ago in another, in another job with, with a culture where it was easier to sit on your hands and not make any mistakes than try something and risk failure. I think good implementers who are willing to try stuff and innovate, and we're just hiring for a few people in that mode here at the REC at the moment, um, are absolutely valuable to me because they're the ones who bring practicality and operational delivery to the kind of purpose-based direction that I'm pushing. It, it suggests within your approach um, a sort of broader notion of trust. If you're prepared to give folk that sort of freedom, okay, here we are, we're aligned to purpose, mm -hmm. principles of what we're trying to achieve, but giving people the freedom to go off, deliver, mm -hmm. but experiment along the way. I, I, how have you learned over the years to know when you can trust folk and when you can't? That might be too... Mm. Um, well, I think the challenge for me is, I mean, we're all very kind of reserved Brits in terms of uh, uh, the R people at the REC and maybe a lot of the, uh, of the viewers are as well. And we tend to let things be implicit. Uh, for me, I think trust is built on being very explicit Got about it. what the terms of the relationship are, yes. what you're asking for, yes. and, and how people can expect you to react at different points to different things. Yes. Um, I think if you go through that discipline of not leaving things implicit, yes. even though you might both agree implicitly what the rules are, then that gives you a framework within which you can grow a, a, a trusting relationship and if you look at something like the Edelman Trust Barometer you know the impact on engagement and innovation from employees who trust the organisation and of course by the organisation they always mean the leadership um, is absolutely astounding. Yes, N Neil uh, we've given our viewers lots to think about uh, so thank you very much for your time and all the best. Thank you, my pleasure.